what are the forces that are going to keep you to stay in the current role? So I was thinking that way more. So for me, I would say that there are three things that motivate me the most. The first one is if the current job is motivating you enough to learn new things, or if it's really giving you new stuff to learn. So if you are progressing in this role, that's the first one. And the second one is the people I'm working with. So if I'm enjoying the the working vibe with the people surrounded by me, that includes your colleagues, your managers, or other people from the other teams that, that are working on the same project with you. I think that is very important. Welcome back to the Fresh Engineer podcast, where fresh engineers share their stories. I'm your host and mechanical engineer Anna Reich, and in today's episode, I'm talking to Jia Hua Li, who's an energy engineer from Taiwan, who is now working as energy efficiency system verification engineer at the networking and telecommunications company Ericsson in Lund here in Sweden. We used to live in the same dorm while studying at KTH in Stockholm, and we also later ended up being colleagues at Northvolt for a while. And now she's visiting Stockholm again for a few days. So when we met up for dinner a few days before the recording, I was luckily able to convince her to come onto the podcast. In our conversation, we talk about how growing up in Taiwan inspired her to study energy engineering, how important it is to pick the right engineering major, a surprising aspect of working full-time as an engineer that's very difficult to experience as an intern, what her day-to-day -day work looks like at Ericsson, and one big misconception about the energy industry. So I hope you take as much from our conversation as I did. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming and so spontaneously too. Yeah. Literally three days ago, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you agreed to this. We're totally not expecting this, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> why not? I'm really excited. So I'd like to start all the way at the beginning, basically. What were you like as a kid? You know, what were you interested in and where did you grow up? Mm, yes. So, um, you know that I'm from Taiwan and I basically grew up in a city that is called Taichung, which is like the second uh, biggest city in Taiwan. And um, I was, mm, what was I like as a kid? Um, I would say it was just like a very normal kid. I cannot think of any... You you know, other word to describe myself. But yeah, I guess I was just a very normal and ordinary kid. I really loved mathematics mm. when I was a kid because I really liked the way that you solved the, the problem step by step. And the way that you are solving the issue is is in a very logical way as well. So I really like mathematics. And I think that is somehow affecting me to choose what I want to study after I uh, finish my high school. So you were really into mathematics was there anything else you liked in high school? I was very into Chinese literature as well, but I think it was more because it can balance my feeling for mathematics because when I was doing mathematics, it was really like 100% focus. But when I was studying Chinese literature, it actually allows me to kind of relax myself and also really think in a more emotional or sentimental way. So I think it was a very good balance. Mm. So that was like my second favorite subject. And so then when you finished high school, mm -hmm. what were the different career options you were considering and how did you make that decision? It was very diverse actually. The most interesting one to me at that point was actually vet, it's called vet, animal or, doctor. An yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was very into that because um, uh, since I were like seven or six years old, I had my first uh, pet, which was a small sparrow. And I really, really liked the feeling of uh, taking care of a small animal because a bird right exactly it's like a small bird <laughs> and it's like um, I don't know it just gives me a lot of inner peace when I'm like talking to them or just you know change their water or change their food uh, so at that point I was really wanting to be a vet when I graduated but my mom was super she doesn't really like this idea because her opinion is more like if you really want to be a doctor she wanted me to be a a doctor that is for human so medical doctor that is working in the hospital not the vet which i can actually understand because in in taiwanese um education circumstance um i think parents um are more like they they, they want their kids to be in a position that is having higher society status 
is. So that's why she wanted me to be a doctor. Yeah, for human. So yeah, that's why. But yeah, that was actually my first option. And and of course, engineering, because my brother was, uh, she, he was starting chemical engineering at that time. So I had uh, some talk with him as well. What were the kind of things you asked him? It was like, um, what do you think about studying engineering? And because he is actually six years older than me. So when I was going to the university, he was actually graduating from his master. And the school I applied to, the university, was actually the same as he studied before as well. So I was asking about like, what's the role you're going to take in the future? Or what are the options that you can do as a chemical engineer and so on? And he gave me a lot of thoughts, actually. He was like, yeah. So it was really a very realistic discussion. He was like, if you really want to be a vet, you need to think of many things. So you like animals. Um, that's the reason why you want to become a vet. When you really are a vet, most of the animals that are coming to you are either wounded or uh, sick or in a very bad situation. So you really need to have that kind of mental preparation for this kind of situation because that's what a doctor is usually doing. And at the point, I was really a little bit shocked by that fact because I was only thinking in a very innocent way. I was only thinking, yeah, I like animals. Why not? And then after this kind of very realistic discussion, I realized that maybe that's not the best way for me. So we ended up talking about engineering more and we said that in, in Taiwan, it's actually a very safe career to take because uh, you you won't have a very low salary. Usually the salary for an engineer in Taiwan is really usually quite nice. I wouldn't say very good, but it's quite nice compared to the other occupations. So we ended up saying that maybe engineering was the better option. What convinced you that you want to go into engineering? Was there like a specific like that you liked or? There was actually no like a very outstanding factor that really um, that really convinced me to go for engineering. I think it was more like a combination of several factors. Like um, I think at that point I was really taking my family's um, expectation into consideration because I, as a kid, I really want to fulfill what they really want me to do. So after considering several factors like the future career and also what my family wants me to do and also I was not super how to say like engineering is not something that I feel like oh I really don't want, want to do it it's not like I have this very strong objection to that so after combining all these reasons I feel like yeah that's something I can totally try to do mm. and also my brother always tell me, uh, tell me that even if you like choose engineering and you ended up that you don't actually like it it's totally fine I mean, it's the, the education is only giving you an option or more like yeah, the engineering school is more like training your mind when you uh, see things and also how you try to solve problems. So yeah, it's it's totally fine if you want to choose other things than becoming an engineer. So I decided to go for this option. And how did you then make the decision to go into energy engineering? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> when I was around 18 years old and 19 years old, we had in Taiwan, we had a lot of discussion about energy transition at that point. So the city I, I was born, uh, Taichung, actually has a very big power plant. Uh, it's coal-fired. And the carbon emission was actually one of the most uh, polluted power plants in the world. And so we always kind of suffer from this air pollution, especially in wintertime. This has always been in my childhood. So we would always watch the news saying that the air is actually very dangerous today. The air quality is very bad. Bad, so please try to wear a mask when you go out and, and so on like this. So I have always had this kind of feeling about uh, energy is something that we are going to change in the future. And especially when I was going to graduate from my high school, Taiwan was talking about facing now nuclear energy because of what happened in Japan, the Fukushima earthquake. So at that point, I feel like hmm, maybe I can go for energy engineering. And plus, that was uh, the, the university I went to was actually the first one they started this energy engineering program. So I thought that it would be very interesting to see what's going to be like mm -hmm. in the program. And you studied... Wait, I wrote this down. <laughs> so you studied at the Shenkong University in Taiwan. Yes. Did you specifically choose this university or was it just the closest one? Oh, okay. Yes. So I chose this university basically because... Uh, so they have this... Uh, that was the only one that has have this uh, energy engineering program. Mm -hmm. And also... 
um, that's the same university my brother studied before mm-hmm. as well. So we are actually quite familiar with the campus because we we visited him before uh, as well before I joined this university. So yeah, it was very familiar. So we chose this university. And what was your experience like studying it? Was it yeah how you had expected, or was there anything different from what you expected? I think yeah. I think at that point I was I was mm, expecting more field trip so like we probably would go to more i don't know power plants to see um mm. like either renewable energy or just fossil fuel power plants and so on but we were not actually having that not so many opportunity to, to go for that but other than that i think it was just yeah it was meeting my expectation mm-hmm. what was the hardest part of your studies i think the hardest part was like yeah i think th- this has something to do for a taiwanese because uh when we were high school students we really need to study for a very long hour for example you would go to school like from 7 uh, a.m and then you would go back home around 10 p.m so like the entire how how many was it 15 hours you're basically just studying so you really have a lot of time to focus on your study but after you finish that high school like such high pressure studying you enter university and then you realize that no one is going to you know force you into this time frame to study and that actually was very challenging for me because I suddenly feel like I don't need to study anymore. And that's how your parents would told you as well uh, before you go to university. They would be like, uh, so if you go to a very good university, then you you don't need to study anymore. You just need to play for your four years in university. So I think that was like kind of like the mindset I had mm-hmm. when I was in university. So I, I at first I had a very hard time to really focus on um, my study. I was playing so many different things at the same time. So it was kind of hard. But I, yeah, I managed that I was, um, it was just, I need to have some more time before to, to plan for my studies and, and it actually worked out. Would you say that you needed to build up Gil to motivate yourself to study instead of, you know, like outside forces <laughs> telling you to study or? Yeah, exactly. It was like, um, there was no such big motivation anymore because I didn't really have a goal to achieve like for each semester or for my four year of study in the university at the beginning but then like after you go for sophomore it's called sophomore, the second, the second year yeah. yes the second year of your university then you you started to think uh, what do you want to do after this university so I started to set up some goal to really motivate myself mm. and do some planning as well. Do you have any advice for students you know on the first day of their of their studies how to make it through this four years yes I think it would be very nice if they can make plans and also really make goals to see what they really want to achieve in long term or short term it's fine but at least you need to really have some goals to motivate you once you have these goals and achievements that you want to fulfill then you really need to have some rough plans for them as well I think that is going to direct you to the right direction so at least you won't be so distracted from other things because in university you really have a lot of things you can do but I mean if you are always keeping yourself on the right track then I don't think you won't be too far away from your goal after four years when you look back to yourself I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into what energy engineering is so as I understand it it's basically covering a lot of different engineering disciplines that are all related or needed for different aspects of energy engineering Mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about what what kind of problems you solve and which mm-hmm. disciplines you need to solve those problems in energy engineering? I can talk a little bit about what we did as master students or bachelor students when we were trying to solve some assignments uh, mm-hmm. questions because as you know that I actually didn't really end up in um, such energy engineering field. So for example a typical project we, we, we have done in master was like for example you would solve for example simulation problems for power system. So for example, if you would add another renewable resources to the grid and you would need to see how that would affect the full power system. So in this kind of situation, you would need to have some background about, let's say if the renewable resources is wind power, you would need to know some knowledge about wind power. For example, at what kind of wind speed limitation would actually trigger the wind turbine to stop. And you would need to have knowledge about power system as well. And also if you really need to do a very good simulation what kind of tools you're going to use
use, for example, we were using MATLAB to run this kind of simulation. So in this kind of project, you would actually be needing different kind of courses to support you. And you would also need to do a lot of self-learning as well to really guide you through solving this kind of issue. I did want to ask you, maybe going back a little bit, like a question, what advice you would give to high school students who want to maybe consider, maybe they're considering energy engineering or other types of engineering, how to make that decision? Hmm, that's a hard question. You mean like how to decide which engineering field to go to? Yeah, if engineering is for them and then also which field to go into. Okay. I think if they are not sure if engineering is for them, I think they can first ask themselves. They are really interested in a specific engineering topic. For example, some people are very interested in, for example, energy like me. I think for high school students, to be honest, like when I was high school, I, I also had this very big confusion as well. I, I was very unsure that was the right decision, even though my family was supporting me a lot and I know that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't end up too bad, even if I don't like it <laughs> in, after these four years. But I was also having this very big confusion, how it will be like in the end. But if I were to talk to myself <laughs> at 18 years old, yeah. I would probably say that just make sure that you have a very curious mind and this is something that you're interested in. Maybe it's kind of hard to say you are interested in a specific field when you're not understanding enough, but this is something that you can test yourself. You can you can search for some articles, you can go talk to people that have that is already doing this job and you can talk to them and see how it's actually look like as a specific engineer and then you can decide whether I would like to go for that, whether I would like to become like that in the future. But I think one of the most important thing to keep up in mind is that think study engineering no matter what field. It doesn't mean that you need to become an engineer. I know that people who had study engineering but they actually end up becoming a sales or they become a product manager or I don't know just many different kind of jobs. So I don't think engineering as a major is meant to limit your options. I think it's more like giving you more options. So I think that is something that high school high school students can always keep up in mind. So just don't afraid to make a choice if you think that it's really something you're up. Do you think it's super important to pick the right type of engineering? Um, to be honest, like right now, as I have already uh, started to, to work as an, as an engineer, I actually don't think that it matters so much. I feel like sometimes when the company is choosing the right person to join the team, of course, they want you to be having an engineering background. But if it's really that specific engineering background, it really depends. For example, uh, sometimes they would just really need someone who had engineering background to have this engineering mindset or have easier time to understand what is going on in their team. Because if you're coming from, for example, a totally different background that say like literature, then it would be kind of too hard for you to understand an engineering world. But if you already study engineering before, then actually it would be an easier entrance for you. So I would say for some specific uh, situations, it's maybe not so difficult. Yeah, but it also depends on the, the the situations and also what kind of jobs you're looking for. You also went on an exchange in China, right? Yes. During your bachelor's studies. So why did you decide to do that? And where in China did you go and what was it like? It was actually a very shallow reason. <laughs> I went for this exchange was only because that it was for free and I I have always wanted to explore other places, other cities a lot and uh, Beijing was the one that I was always wanted to go. So yeah, that's why I chose there. And also uh, the university, the, the Beihang University is actually also a very good university in China as well. So I figured out maybe I can just try to see how it's like in their daily life. And how did you like that experience? Oh, it was very good. It was really like one of the best time I had <laughs> in my life. <laughs> Because points I really need, don't need to think of too much things. I just need to focus on like, where do you want to go to travel every day? I mean, we did take some courses, but it was really like very relaxing courses. Like, uh, yes, like some some engineering courses, but it was not so heavy because the, the professors, they know that you're here to, for your summertime. So it was very relaxing. And 
then after your bachelor's studies, you decided to do a master's degree. Mm-hmm. How did you make that decision of, should I do a master's degree? Mm-hmm. And which one should I do? Mm-hmm. And even should I go abroad, which you did? I think for me, it was very lucky because in my program, in my bachelor's study, lots of the seniors in our program, they actually went abroad to study as well. So they gave me a lot of advices. And also you can see what kind of options or what kind of schools they, they went to as well. So it was actually very easy for me. I have always known that I would take master degree because after the third year study in my university, I feel like I have taken a lot of courses. I have equipped myself with some engineering disciplines and so on. But I feel like it was not, how to say, like focus enough on a specific field because energy engineering, you would have a lot of different track you can choose. But there was no such track in bachelor. It was more general at that time. So I know that uh, going to a master degree would for sure give me a more clear view on which track I want to choose. And then I saw this program, which is, you know, energy, which um, some of my senior that also took this program as well. And it was giving a very generous scholarship as well. So that's why I, I decided to took it. Well, my reasons are very shallow. I, <laughs> I think that's normal, honestly. Yeah. I mean, what kind of deep reason? <laughs> Maybe people will be like, yeah, after comparing the, you know, the the ranking of the school, I feel like, blah, 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 and this school is more uh, better in this field and the, the other one is better in the other field. But for me, it was like money. <laughs> Just money. <laughs> exactly, money. It's a good reason. You studied a double degree mm-hmm. master program, right, in Barcelona and in Stockholm. Mm-hmm. So you were at UPC in Barcelona and then at KTH in Stockholm. Mm-hmm. Did you pick those universities specifically? Oh, yes. When I joined this uh, Uh, double degree program that actually gave us some options uh, for first year and second year. You can choose two different universities. And for the first year, it was only KDH in in Stockholm and KU Leuven in Belgium. And I have already heard a lot of things about KU Leuven, how strict they are. So I was a little bit afraid of that. So I decided to go for KDH. And for the second year, I chose UPC in Barcelona. It was mainly because I was a little bit tired of uh, the winter in Stockholm. And the food in stock. <laughs> yeah, it was just not the best place for, you know, students. <laughs> yeah, so I decided to go for UPC. And I thought that it was a very good combination because like one is in Nordic and the other one is like Southern Europe. So it was it was a very good experience. I used to study energy in smart cities, right? Exactly. Uh, what does that mean? It was uh, called energy for smart cities. So basically smart cities is actually not a very clearly defined concept in that study. So they didn't really really like try to limit your thought about smart cities. It was more like they give you different kind of courses. And of course, you can take some optional courses as well to find what you think about smart cities. So I think it was actually very good. For example, we took battery system as well, because in energy for smart cities, you will need a battery systems to really stabilize your power supply. And also, for example, we took power system as well, which is mainly focusing on the grid. So it was really actually a lot of subject going on to help you form your thoughts about smart cities and how the energy should look like. Coming from Taiwan, what was it like for you to study in Spain and in Sweden? What were maybe the differences between the three places in studying and also in living there? I think the biggest challenge was the first year in Stockholm. As you know, Taiwan is, you know, tropical. So the first winter in Stockholm was really hard for me. I was not expecting that low temperature. And I also went to Kiruna at that point as well. So it was really just mind-blowing. I really don't know what's happening around me, like those snow. I was very excited at the first and then uh, not so excited anymore. And Kiona is like a really northern place in Sweden, so yeah. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> like you would expect to see northern light, so it's like really, really, I think it's in the Arctic Circle. Yeah, it yes. is. So yeah, it was very different uh, the first year in, in Stockholm. And uh, I actually didn't spend that much time in Stockholm as planned because of COVID. So I actually went back to Taiwan, I think the second uh, semester. It was a little bit pity because y- you didn't really get the chance to uh, have a very complete experience of studying abroad. But but in, in Barcelona, it was totally a different story. Um, I, I, I stayed for the full year in, in Barcelona and I was also doing an internship in Barcelona as well. So the experience there was 
was more practical for me because of this internship. Mm -hmm. I didn't have this kind of opportunity when I was in Stockholm. But in Barcelona, it was also during COVID time, so we were also very limited. But if I were going to compare these three different cities or three different places, I would say that I think in, in Taiwan and also KDH, we were more focusing on the theoretical study. Of course, in KDH and also in Taiwan, we had some chances to do some kind of experiment courses, but I think they were more focusing on the um, on the studies itself and more project-based or assignment-based uh, courses. But when I was in Barcelona, maybe it was also due to that was my second year of study. So I was taking internship and also doing some more practical uh, project, which was more related to what's going on in the industry. I saw that you did a lot of internships during your bachelor and last, I think, five in total. Yes. <laughs> now, do you have any advice for engineering students for how to land an internship position? Oh, you mean like, for example, if they have like multiple choices? Yeah, or like how to get in. Ah, and, okay. and then I think, uh, I mean, my next question would be also to how to pick a good one. Ah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think internships are very good opportunities for students to have a quick glance on what's going to happen when you really finish your studies and work as a full-time professional. The way I was doing was mainly I would just uh, so we all have a LinkedIn I was just really like browsing uh, the jobs that is uh, they are posted on LinkedIn a lot when I was looking for internship and also um, try to connect to people who are working in the team that you're interested in to be an intern so that was a very good way to to really connect and talk about the the project they are working on and to see uh, if you are actually interested in that topic so having done that many internships I guess you had some that were better or more useful more insightful and then others that weren't so much what do you think makes a great internship I think there are many factors for sure to to affect your experience uh, in an internship but from my experience I really had some quite good internship that I really feel like I had a lot to take away and it was also still like it's still now very useful in my my career and now looking back I think those successful factors would actually actually brought because of the clearly defined assignments in the internship. So after you enter this <clears throat> internship, they give you very clear defined assignment that you're going to achieve in this two months or six months, whatever defined for the, the period. And uh, the second part is the, the mentorship. So in some, I would say probably bigger company, they would have more resources to assign you a mentor to, to really guide you through the company and also so to really be a projection for you to see how the, the working professional look like. So I would say that these two things are quite important to define a successful internship. After your master's studies, you started working at Northwold first as an intern and then as a data analyst, right? Yes. So how did you make that happen? How did you look for your first job? Uh, it was actually a very tough period of time, actually, um, because as a non-European graduate uh, in Europe, university universities, you had this uh, limited period of time to look for a job. And I applied for this job search and visa in Sweden, which allowed me to stay one year mm -hmm. to look for a job. So I saw this data associate intern post on LinkedIn. So I simply actually just applied for that because I thought that Northville was the company that I always wanted to join as it had a very a reputation when I was studying Inno Energy because Inno Energy also sponsored them as well. So we also have some alumni that was working that there is a working in Northville already so mm. that's how I think that it would be a very good option to start my career what did you do as a first data associate and then data analyst so the the team that I was staying was more like trying to define the standard for building a battery factory and the role as a data analyst I would say well it was actually just like an advanced level of data associate I would say yeah uh, data analyst. It was to uh, try to find a very good way to define the different processes that are happening in the factory and trying to have a more standard way to have this naming convention 
know, and also how they would call in the system. So different system can talk smoothly with each other without too many different kind of uh, lens that it, that are happening. So yeah, it was mainly to to create this more standard in the factory. What advice would you give to engineering students right out of university looking for their first job? I would say don't be too afraid of trying new things. I think for for some people, like I was the same group of people as well. I was very afraid of making mistakes. Yeah, I was always feeling like putting a very harsh view on myself or trying to be a very experienced person in a very short period of time, which is totally unrealistic, not thinking back to that. But yeah, so I guess that I would, if I were going to talk to this um, young or fresh graduate from master or from bachelor, they are looking for their first job, then I would say just to be, just don't afraid of making mistake because everyone was graduated once upon a time <laughs> from some school before. So they must, uh, they have all experienced this same thing before. So just be very curious and don't be afraid of making mistakes. And what do you do now? What is your job title and what is the kind of company that you work at? I'm working as an energy efficiency system verification engineer. It's a very well name. <laughs> but basically it's a system verification engineer. So what I do is basically we we do um, hardware and software verification. So for example, in the process of uh, creating a new product, we would have several phases. And after the, the phase of uh, designing and prototyping has already done, and also the product is also out, then it will go through this kind of verification phase, which you will need to verify if the first assumption or the first design was fulfilled. That's what I do right now. And you worked at Ericsson. Mm -hmm. So just for the people who are not living in Sweden. Yeah. So what is what kind of company is this? Um, so Ericsson is a company that is um, mm. focusing on the end-to-end -end solution for radio access network. So it provides not only hardware, but also software solution and also some services to a uh, customer or the operators to have this internet connection, sorry, internet communication solution. And that was actually quite the career change going from data analyst to energy efficiency, <laughs> system <laughs> verification engineer. Yeah. <laughs> Long Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, so uh, why did you make the change from data analyst to energy efficiency system verification engineer? When I was preparing this question, I skipped this one yesterday because I found it very hard to answer. <laughs> <laughs> did you want to go like back to the roots, you know, of your studies as, you mm -hmm. know, it's more in direction energy again, right? Yes, that was that was part of the reason. I mean, working as a data analyst in Northvolt, I mean, Northvolt is uh, it's a, it's a company that is producing battery for sure. It's, it's also so an energy related and very related company as well. But I feel like my role as data analyst was actually not really fulfilling what I wanted to do when I first graduated or not really fulfilling my expectation in terms of learning. So I decided to go back to more like energy related topic from the job position point of from the very, very low level. Yes. Um, can you paint a picture of your job now? Like, what does your workplace look like? Mm -hmm. What are you wearing? What do you do in a day? So I'm working in an R&D uh, in Ericsson. And we have a lab that is very closely to our office area. It really actually depends on what kind of tasks I'm going to do that day. But for example, I will start my day like this. First, I will have a morning meeting with our team members. We, we usually have a very quick uh, group meeting to align out what we are going to do that week or mm -hmm. that day. So for example, if that day, I decided to dive into a more a normal task that we have already been doing for a while, which is basically testing our radio. Then I would put on my ESD sleepers, which is the, <laughs> I don't want to say it wrong, so I need to check it. <laughs> Electrostatic yeah, discharge sleepers, mm. which is basically pre uh, protecting the equipment from being affected by this electrostatic. Mm. So I would put on this sleepers and I would go to the lab to make sure that the connection of all the equipments are correctly connected. So the radio and the baseband connected correctly. And then I will go back to the office area and start to look into the testing node and then start to do some testing. And for this kind of task that we have been doing for a while, that we have a predefined script that is basically just you simply need to run it and then you will get a very complete uh, result of the testing. And then after several hours of running this uh, test script, I will do some analysis on the data that I have got from the test 
results. And then we make it to a report. It's more like individual tasks. So I would make it to a report and then we will have a review later on in the week or next week to talk about the data, if that is correct, or if there is anything that is having abnormal behavior in the system or in the product that we need to further discuss with the project. What is your favorite and least favorite part of the job? So favorite part of this job is actually it has a very good combination of hardware and software. So like I said, I would uh, go into lab to do some connection or uh, to dive into the hardware a little bit. When it comes to testing, I would have the chance to really have some coding experience, for example. When it comes to a task that is not what we have done before, it's a newer task, it's a newer feature, then uh, when it comes to testing, we need to write a new script for that kind of testing, hmm. which means that I will have lots of energy and time to 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 dive into this uh, to write a script about that. So I think this combination of software and hardware is the, the favorite part I have for mm. this job. And my least favorite part, I wouldn't say it's the least favorite part. I would say, I mean, it's a risk because when you're working in lab, when you're doing some, uh, for example, wire connection or when you're moving some hardware, usually they're kind of heavy. So it's possible for you to hurt yourself a little bit, not too much. I mean, you, of course, you have to be very very careful. Mm. So I think that is the risk that we have in this in this job. And uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's very normal to have this kind of risk in all kind of roles. So yeah, I wouldn't say this is my least favorite. I would say this is something that I really need to be very careful about. Mm. Yeah, like a downside of the job. Yeah. Exactly. What is one misconception about your job or your industry that a lot of people get wrong? I didn't prefer for this one because I don't know like what people think about this job actually. Mm. I mean, I mean, for example, what would you think after you hear about my description about this job? It's a very boring. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's not what I would think. Or maybe let's take the energy industry. You know, okay. people hear you're an energy engineer. Mm -hmm. Do they ask you like some stupid question where like why would you ask that? Or yes, I was just talking about this to to uh, to Ishan actually. Mm -hmm. So we were saying like sometimes people ask you, so how do you save energy? And we were like, you know, just basically think that you have been taught when you were junior high school students, <laughs> you know, just to turn off the lights when you're not in the room and unplug. You know, <laughs> this kind of very basic. I mean, this kind of question is kind of, um, I think, hard to answer, like for me and also some of my classmates. We, we both think that it's, I mean, it's a very reasonable question to ask. I think also like hard to really say something that is out of the box. I mean, if you want to dive into like some specific technology, like a uh, smart home appliance and so on, of course, that would be a solution. But if we're talking about like something that is just small talk, very basic things that you can do in your daily life, then I would say just turn off the lights when you're not in a room and so so yeah usually there are some kind of discussions <laughs> okay <laughs> and it's not really the focus of your studies is it? no exactly like I, we don't focus on how to you know save energy I mean we, we do but like uh, I think not for example in our daily studies when we were students the way we would talk about like saving energy would be for example you would how would you would uh, better utilize uh, the battery system that is uh, in the grid uh, uh, or how would you decrease the carbon intensity of the grid and so on. We were not really focusing on like saving energy from daily life. That was not a very good <laughs> answer, but I think it was. I think it's actually you know, to better I, understand what um, energy engineers do. I think it always helps to kind of ask what you don't do to then get yeah. to what you do. What advice would you give someone looking for a job specifically in your industry, so in the energy industry? I think yeah, in my industry, currently, industry, which is the telecommunication uh, industry, I would really suggest this person to have telecommunication background. I think this industry is not a very, it's a very deep uh, industry and it's also very complicated as well. So I think if a person is really interested in this industry or is thinking of taking a position in this industry, then I think it would be very, very good to have a telecommunication background or electrical engineering background. What are some other industries where you 
could work as an energy engineer? Actually, a lot. For example, uh, manufacturing uh, industry, you would probably need to look into the energy efficiency of the manufacturing process, or you could work as a consultant, which gives you lots of diversity on the project you're going to be handling with, or you could be working in the most energy related industry, for example, like a renewable energy company and so on. And we talked a little bit about changing careers. What do you think are some signs to look for that it's time to for a new job? I was also thinking about this question when I'm brushing my teeth this morning. I mean, I think it's a little bit hard to like directly answer what are the signs for me. I think for me, it would be an easier to think what are the forces that are going to keep you to stay in the current role. Mm. So I was thinking that way more. So for me, I would say that there are three things that motivate me the most or pulling me the most. I think the first one is if the current job is uh, motivating you enough to learn new things or if it's really giving you new stuff to learn. So if you are progressing in this role, mm. that's the first one. And the second one is the people I'm working with. So if I'm enjoying the, the working vibe with the people surrounded by me, that includes your colleagues, your managers, or other people from the other teams that, that are working on the same project with you. I think that is very important. And the third one, I would say the salary. It's very realistic. I mean, I don't think um, I need to explain too much about salary, but <laughs> if the salary is not good enough, then of course you will lose the motivation mm. to, to contribute more. Do you think there's any ways in which being an engineer has impacted your life? Like maybe the way you look at things or how you do something? What do you think about? <laughs> I have one. I suddenly thought of one, but maybe this is not better <laughs> to be in the video. But like after studying engineering or working as an engineer, I started to feel like that I don't, I cannot date someone <laughs> that are not working as an engineer or study engineering before. Because I feel like we would not have a lot of common topics to talk about. Maybe this is not, <laughs> you know what? I mean, you need to be able to make a spreadsheet of you move together, right? Uh, exactly. But yeah, let me think of a better answer. <laughs> or maybe asking the other way around. What do you notice that your non-engineering friends don't understand or do differently than you? I have a very weird habit. It sounds like a confession. Um, I like sometimes when I like try to fall asleep, I try to think of some very random things in my mind. And uh, sometimes I would just think of a very random topic, for example. Like I don't really have a very good example right now. But like I would go through some really, really detailed technical questions. And sometimes it's not even related to my field. It's just like, how does this thing actually work? And uh, sometimes I bother my friends with this kind of, kind of questions 3 a.m. And they would be like, can you just go to sleep? <laughs> so they don't really want to discuss. But I, but I think in general, people don't want to discuss this in 3 a.m. Oh, this is really hard. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I think you're supposed to get the answer. Really? Yeah. Oh, it was a very weird one. <laughs> uh, I just want to, you know, prepare the people for what they're going to be like once they start to <laughs> <laughs> What are your career goals going forward? Uh, where do you see yourself in, let's say, five years? Oh, okay. Huh. That's a very good question. That reminds me, I haven't talked about this with my manager. So because uh, telecommunication, this uh, industry is actually super new to me. I'm like a totally a beginner uh, in this industry. When, when I try to set up goals for me or like uh, project myself in five years, I always start from something very basic. So for me, I think uh, I would really, really like to have a deeper knowledge in telecommunication industry. That's something I really want to achieve within five years. And as we know that in telecommunication industry, they are basically uh, progressing in a step of 10 years. So we have uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, and now 6G is coming. So the technology is, is changing. But at the same time, for me, I would need to understand, starting from 4G, how was the technology look like and how was it working? So this is something that I really want myself to be able to learn and be able to be very confident and say, I really understand the technology and how that would be different when we move to next generation of technology. That's the one thing. And the second thing, I think it's more like yeah, I want myself to be a very independent person. But when I say independent person, I don't mean by I cannot finish a, a task by myself right now. It's more like when I'm facing a project or facing a new task, I will be able to find all the resources I need uh, by myself instead of just learning from someone in our team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you want to be like 
like the expert. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I want to be more like a specialist. Mm -hmm. Yes, in my in my role. Then I would love to end with some rapid fire questions if you're up for it. So I'll just ask them and just say the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. So what is one place in Stockholm that everyone absolutely has to visit, or in Sweden? I think in Stockholm, like a very safe answer would be Vasa Museum. I think usually, uh, because when I when I just came to Stockholm, when I ask local people where should I go, they will always go for Vasa Museum. So I would go for the Vasa Museum. It's actually very cool. I mean, you yeah. see the whole ship over there, and you also see some uh, uh, very well preserved history in the museum as well. So I think it was very very interesting. And I think in Sweden in general, I wouldn't recommend a specific place. I think because I'm not so familiar with the whole Sweden right now. But I would say when you're in Sweden, try to go to the natural more because I think that's what Swedish people are proud of as well. I think they're really proud of the the amounts of the nature or the accessibility to the natural in in this country. Yeah, and it's so pretty. I mean, exactly, it's really good. <laughs> really yeah. What fact or experience surprised you the most when you started working after university? I think it really depends on the company and the role. But if I really have to say something that surprised me when I first joined my first company as a full-time employee, the high pass was something that I was not really expect when I was uh, a student. And I think that is something that I that I miss when I was working as an intern because as intern, no one was really thinking you to have, you know, to provide a very high quality of work. And they would expect that you're only coming to learn and they are, of course, uh, willing to take some of their working hours to, to, to guide you through the company as well. So when I was students, I think I actually missed that part. I was being very innocent about this. But um, when I actually started to work as a full-time, I noticed that there are a lot of responsibilities and a lot of things that you need to consider. And uh, and also the high pass in my previous company was also uh, very surprising to me. What is one stereotype about engineers that you think is true? True stereotype? Or one that you think is wrong, we can also change it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think like some people tend to think engineers are very boring. I mean, we're not boring. Totally not. I agree. I mean, we make jokes as well. I think uh, like some of my day that they didn't study engineering during their bachelor or master, they uh, sometimes when they talk to me, they, they try to tease about engineers that they would say, you guys are always so boring. You don't go out during the weekend and so on. But that's totally not true. <laughs> we are very funny people. <laughs> and we know how to party as well. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite blog or podcast? Oh, there is a podcast, but it's in, it's from a Taiwan podcaster. Do you say that? So I don't think people would know that. But basically, it's diving into psychology. So it basically tells you how to tackle some situations and why your emotion re would react to some specific re uh, situations. I think that was very good. Because I think like after start working, I feel like you don't really have, or at least I don't really have too much time to reflect and to really think what I want to do or basically look into myself inside. I think I re I'm really leaking up this kind of uh, time. So when I'm listening to this kind of podcast or this kind of talk, I really start to think through myself in some kind of situations and try to think what I could have done better in that kind of situation in terms of emotion controls. What is the name of the podcast just for the it's three called, Taiwanese people? The, do I, should I say that in Mandarin? Yeah. <laughs> it's called uh, Ma Ke Shuo Shu. Basically, it's uh, Mark talking about book, but I think he has already stopped uh, posting new episodes. Oh, no, no, that's always yeah. tragic. I hope you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, and my favorite question to ask, yeah. if you had to totally abandon your current career and do something completely different, what would you do? Oh, totally abandon? Yeah, no engineering. <laughs> or you mean like wipe my previous memory about no, no, no. as well? You just like, you stop what you're doing and you start okay. a new career. I still have my memory. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't have a plan B, plan Z? Well, I, I, I thought about it before as well, I think. But I just feel like they're just too unrealistic. But anyway. So more unrealistic, the better, I think. Yeah. If I'm not going to be an engineer anymore, I would really love to work as a, like a promoter for national park. Because I'm still like, I still love animals. And I still really want to do something about animals. And like, if we're not talking about like how much you would earn and how stable your life would be, then I think the most interesting job for me is to be a promoter for national park or national reservoir, or especially for protecting a specific uh, endangered animal. Yeah, so that was the last question. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. For the people that, after watching this, want to connect with you or mm -hmm. ask you something, where can they find you? I have LinkedIn, so it's uh, basically the same name, I think. Yeah, we can link your profile. So. Exactly, yeah. So you can uh, text me on LinkedIn. It might take me a while to, to reply because I don't really check that every day. Yeah. But um, welcome to ask me any questions about my role or the career or the study if you're into energy engineering as well. Perfect. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. We did it. That was excellent. I love Jawa's take on engineering being a mindset that you can learn and can use for many different fields, even if you decide to leave engineering at some point. It reminds me of my conversation with Boris Nimchevich in episode two, where he said that he thinks of different experiences as putting skills into his toolbox and is therefore also not afraid of quitting something once he has learned what he wanted to learn from it. This approach takes a lot of pressure out of picking what you want to do with your career at the time that you're choosing your major. So thank you again, Jaguar Lee, for coming onto the show and sharing your story. You can find the show notes for this episode on freshengineer.io slash podcast slash eight, including everything we talked about today. Next week, I will talk to an electrical engineer turned startup founder and CTO about going from a small village in Romania to NYU Abu Dhabi, working at Microsoft and Spotify, and why a bit of ignorance is healthy when you're starting a company. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcast so you don't miss it. Here's already a little sneak peek. If you are not ashamed to tell your idea or to show the solution, it means you've waited too long. If you're like, oh, here's this uh, beautiful thing that I made and you think it's ready to be shown, then it's too late. You waited way too long and most likely it's not something that is actually going to work. And get feedback from people because ideas, honestly, ideas are cheap. It's really the effort that it takes to bring an idea to life. I think in the beginning, we didn't really internalize this. So so, you know, you hesitate. I'm like, oh, but I have this brilliant idea. Probably so many other people have it. So it's important to just like talk about it, get feedback on it, improve it, and then start, you know, building it. And then to keep improving it based on feedback, because you're not going to come up with this brilliant idea just by sitting on your own and not telling anyone about it. Thanks for tuning in to the Fresh Engineer podcast, where fresh engineers share their stories. 